Blessings be upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his family and his companions. Honorable Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, Member of Parliament for Port Dickson. Honorable Professor Emeritus Dr. John Esposito, Georgetown University. Honorable Professor Emeritus Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak, Rector of the International Islamic University, Malaysia. Distinguished Professor Datuk Dr. Usman Bakar, Sheikh Al Kuliah, ISTAC, IIUM. Excellency Ambassadors and Honorable Guests, Distinguished Speakers, Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening and welcome to the opening forum of the International Seminar on Contemporary Islamic Thought and Societal Reforms. Tonight, we are excited to be in the presence of two very distinguished speakers, Honorable Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim and Professor John Esposito. So without further delay, I am pleased to invite distinguished professor Datuk Dr. Usman Bakar, Chef Al Kulia of ISTAC, to deliver his welcome remarks, followed by an introduction on the two prominent speakers. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good evening to everyone. Our distinguished guest panelist of tonight's forum, Yang Bahormat Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, the member of uh, parliament for Port Dickson, our university professor, Dr. John Esposito of uh, Georgetown University in, uh, in the United States, to the members of the Board of Governors of uh, IIUN, and uh, Yang Bahormat, or Yang Rabagia, Emeritus Professor Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli uh, Abdul Razak, the Rector of uh, IIUN, and former Rectors who are present tonight, our distinguished speakers uh, who are speakers at this uh, three day international conference, um, and distinguished, and, and distinguished uh, uh, ambassadors uh, who are present here, and Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, ISTEC IIUN, I would like to welcome all of you to this very important event uh, tonight, the opening forum of our international conference on, on the international seminar on the contemporary Islamic thought and societal reforms. And the theme of this seminar is contemporary Islamic thought and prospects for society reform geocultural perspectives. Um, we have a three-day uh, international conference which began today, this afternoon, and um, we have to, they must go, but in conjunction with this, uh, with this seminar, we organized the opening uh, community forum, which is tonight, uh, and the closing forum on Friday afternoon. Uh, we would certainly invite you all to come to the Friday closing forum. The, with the title, uh, the title of the conference is World Economic Forum 2019, Muslim Responses. And tonight, the theme or the title of the forum is Islam and Multiculturalism. The subtitle is The Need for Educational Reform. I've been asked by some people, why do we have a panel featuring Anwar Ibrahim, Dr. Anwar Ibrahim and John Esposito? Uh, is the seminar, the three seminar, organized in conjunction with the forum, or is it the other way around? Is the forum held in conjunction with the seminar? Well, as it it's up to you how to how significant you want to attach to either one. But anyway, this is a significant um, forum, and of course, it's to me to us here at uh, at this tech, the combination of uh, uh, that to uh, that to Sri Anwar Ibrahim and John Professor John Esposito 
tonight's forum is not something that is awkward, but in fact, very meaningful as for us because uh, we, the theme of our, of our seminar is societal reform. Now, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, yes, he is a politician, uh, and we use his letters his nation, as member of parliament, uh, of politician, and he's one of the reasons why he wants to contest as member of parliament. Why he wants to enter parliament is because he wants to initiate a very important reform. That is his promise. We believe him, and we'll find out tonight. And you can ask him what sort of reform that you want to say, but the focus tonight is on educational reform. Now, as far as the issue of multiculturalism, well, this is a contested term. Again, we have been, I've been criticized, uh, saying that why multiculturalism? This is already an outdated issue. Uh, and, 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 and clearly, it is opposed to Islam. As my reply is, no, multiculturalism is still a contested term. So if you contest the meanings given to that term, why can't Islam contest that? My point of view is that Islam has its own perspectives about multiculturalism. It is not a settled issue. In fact, as multiculturalism becomes a more important issue globally, we need to present the Islamic perspectives on multiculturalism, even in, Malaysia, even in Malaysia itself. I mean, we have to revisit, basically, we have to revisit this issue. And hopefully, tonight, the two speakers will highlight new issues pertaining to this. So basically, the question is, how, or, the, or rather, how should we present ourselves from the perspective of Islam, <clears throat> this issue? And but of course, we single out the issue of educational reform because that is the key to everything in a sense. Um, is our education system in line or not with the demands, with, uh, with the demands and the, uh, in a sense, the needs of multicultural societies? So I leave it to that. So we, thank you very much for the two of speakers. Uh, we shall begin, uh, but I want to say something about the organizer of this event. Uh, actually, for this particular forum tonight, uh, as distinct from the seminar itself, this event is organized, first of all, by ISTEC, uh, IIUM, uh, co-organized by Muslim, uh, the, the Muslim Intellectual Forum, whose advisor is Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim, and by the Center for Islamic Economics, the Kulia of Economics and Management of IIUM. So the three organizations organize this event tonight. Um, and uh, I, I attended, of course, the, uh, this uh, event organized by the uh, Muslim Education Forum some time back, uh, uh, and we had at that time, it features our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Zaudin Sarda, uh, who is the founding director of the Center for Post-Normal uh, and Policy Studies. And uh, in fact, Dr. Zaudin Sarda, uh, he is also a speaker in the three-day forum. He will be giving his talk on Friday uh, before noon on the subject of the future of Muslim reforms itself. It's a very, very interesting topic. So now we invite uh, Dr. Sri Anu Ibrahim to make his presentation. Um, and then later we will have uh, Professor John Esposito as someone, as an outsider. Uh, not so an outsider, but he's an outsider anyway. Uh, from the United States, we respond to um, Dr. Sri Anwar sorry, uh, Brian's uh, presentation with all the respect. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. Sudah saya, Suman Bakar, Professor John Esposito, dan Sri Zulkifli, Duta-duta dan tetamu-tamu kehormat uh, Saya menganggap ini satu penghormatan luar biasa uh, Oleh uh, kerana jemputan ini sebenarnya Jemputan untuk mendengar kupasan <coughs> dan hujahan intelektual uh, Dan saya ini uh, lebih dikenali sebagai 
petugas politik biasa. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it's profound uh, pleasure on my part to express my gratitude to Osman and the team uh, in creating this new uh, or supporting this new found freedom to continue and exchange uh, reason discourse on issues which some of us even consider very contentious. Now, this is of course relevant to our discourse tonight because without creative thinking, without the essential freedom to articulate your views, we cannot hope to achieve a meaningful societal reform. I just got back from Doha together with Davut Oglu and um, Rashid Anusi as speakers at the a very, very important conference, 70 years of Marhum Malik Ben Nabi. Now, Malik Ben Nabi is not certainly a precursor, but a very profound figure that calls for societal reform, that expressed his utter disgust at the failure of Muslims to think freely and to interpret even the Quran in terms of its relevance to the society at present and, 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 and during his time. He was uh, very involved in the initial struggle against the French, but he, was, mm, he felt more appalled at the rate and understanding of Islam by the community, by essentially Islamic communities. Now, in his um, phenomenon, of Al-Quran, he talked about memorizing the Quran, which is of course encouraged, but not understanding its uh, message and the call for Islam mastata, which is of course central to the Quranic message. In his um, Shurut and Nahda, conditions for Renaissance, he of course talked about understanding a creative and reasoned discourse which must be a precondition which is essentially a mastery not only of the language but of knowledge and of, although he did not craft in the way that uh, T.S. Eliot talks about information, knowledge and wisdom certainly in his Shurut uh, and Nahda the conditions of Renaissance, he talks about the need for the Muslim society to engage and to have a profound understanding through knowledge and educational reform. Now, some of us assume that educational reform can be achieved through efforts by intellectuals and educationists. They may be right, but they have never been proven right throughout history. Salahuddin al-Ayubi, for example, is known to be a, a fighter. Yes, a, 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 a leader with such passion for justice and reform. But you must, uh, some of you follow the life of Salahuddin, would realize that that for the first 10 years after he took over, remember, not before he took over, the reform can be initiated by a clear, definitive policy. And he then used mosque to alert the Muslims about the predicament, predicament and malice of the society by going back to the Quran, understanding Islam, but relating it to the plight of the modern man during his period. The malice of the Ummah because of their failure to appreciate the need to master knowledge. So to my contention, therefore, as Osman alluded to earlier, is to support this uh, effort by the present Pakatan Harapan government, for example. I have uh, asked uh, the speaker in the house to support the setting up of a caucus on reform and governance in parliament 
and hopefully the Senate that could oversee the need for societal reform. Because I don't believe that we can have effective education reform without the commitment, the political will to do that. Now, I would summarize uh, the exhortations by Malik Ben Nabi when he talked about the need not only to acquire traditional Islamic knowledge, but modern disciplines, particularly during his period, psychology and sociology, because he's essentially a Khaldunian, he revised the uh, interpretation of Ibn Khaldun in many ways, because to him, the interpretation of the Quran must be to understand the text and the context. Now, <clears throat> you are familiar, of course, I mean, this is a, essentially a gathering of intellectuals, uh, a good grasp of our own history and historical antecedents. But you would realize, therefore, that being a bit uh, nostalgic about the past is certainly no answer for the present. Understanding, yes, but we must also grapple with the problems of the present. Some of us are familiar with this uh, Harry, Mul Harry Miller's uh, education without a soul. I tend to be a bit cynical to some of them, how Muslim scholars react to this book. I'm sure Tansi Zulkifli is more familiar because he's at the helm of the university. We talk about Harvard. And nobody could question the standard of excellence in academic discipline in Harvard. Since I was at Georgetown, I would say similar to Georgetown. <clears throat> but Miller's contention as a former dean was that the failure of the educational enterprise at Harvard is not in terms of its excellence in terms of academic disciplines, but have created or allow the emergence of a new generation that is devoid of soul. It's a soulless society. They have university, they can articulate on all issues, but very little concern about the plight of the poor, the issue of discrimination against the blacks, outside the campus. I heard a comment from some of intellectuals here who says that at least in our universities, they may include the stack and IIU, we may not achieve academic excellence, excellence, but we have a soul. I'm not too sure whether we achieved that level of understanding, appreciation and grasping soul as envisaged both in Miller's book or certainly in Islamic tradition and aims of education. I think it is better that we begin with some humility. Humility to accept there are serious challenges affecting us in terms of academic disciplines, in terms of quality of education, and not the debate which to me seems to be quite irrelevant in our present discourse. Of course, we have linguistic skills. In Malaysia, we are quite determined to ensure that there must be adequate mastery of the national language. But it's not a zero-sum game. Languages which include English or Arabic or French must be open for students to master the more languages, the more profound their level of understanding and education. But the debate here seems to be quite a zero-sum game. You master Malay, you must ignore English. You talk about competency in English, then you are seen, some of us may be in that category, to be ignoring the importance of the national language. But to me, 
more challenging is the whole issue of academic excellence, the quality of education, which is a major challenge in our society. We do hear reports. I remember in 1961, Professor Diraja Nku Aziz tends to be very cynical against experts, uh, economic analysts, bankers, who tend to give somewhat uh, very impressive reports and accounts of our achievements. You just need to travel one hour away from Kuala Lumpur to see grinding poverty or gross inequality within Cup. Which oftentimes the experts in Kuala Lumpur, the economists, um, the analysts, which Rashid you are familiar with, seems to ignore. And I think this is of course a failure to grasp. And it's similar case of education. We cannot compare ourselves with the poorer societies, our countries in the Muslim world. We have to acknowledge the fact that we still have a long way to go to achieve academic excellence and to ensure that our students are being trained in terms of discipline, character, which have clear relevance to the contention of what a soul or a soulless society should not be and or society with strong moral, ethical values and principles. So the, my question is therefore, is not whether it is Islamic or Western so much as to have a clear position on the need to excel and of course to attain the character and ethical moral values which is clearly a, a, a clearly a principle that must be strongly embedded in Islamic ethics and religion. But this is of course for Francis Zuckerberg to think about. I'm just giving a, a provoking some issues here. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Of course, naturally suggesting that we are essentially in a hopeless state. But I do question some of us who seem to think. I mean, the more Western educated um, political leaders or educationists would come and search for some report, some obscure findings to show how great we are. And, and the, on the other side, the so-called Islamists would say that, look, in our universities, particularly in this university, we have actually found the answer. I'm very involved, I'm very supportive. All these years, although for the last 20 years, I was not able to enter the university for reasons known to you, but my heart and soul is with the university. I'm still committed to the idea of education that must have, must not only focus on educational excellence in terms of academic excellence, but also in my character, ethical, moral, values and principles. My fear is this uh, attitude um, that, that seems to uh, be to me in a state of denial. If we truly understand the meaning of reform, the need to reform in this country we should start by acknowledging that we are on such a low threshold. Then the challenge should be more meaningful. We can compare ourselves to the poorest countries in Africa and we can gloat about it. But certainly, I think the challenge is to compare with the best. Academic excellence, of course, in the top universities in terms of moral ethical values. If we don't have them now, we look at the classical universities and institutions of the past. 
Now, um, I would end with a quote from Tocqueville. Uh, I hope it is not too contentious, as his text, so called more tolerant. I mean, after all, we are talking about multiculturalism. And uh, though I did not, but I leave it to the more structured lecture by Esposito, not only a clique, but uh, some of his books, including the encyclopedia, was clearly my compendium when I was in the solitary confinement in the prison cell. So um, I at least can safely say that there is also some blessing to be whole and then thrown into the solitary confinement lockup because it's an excellent time where you can read as much as you can, as you want. Um, some of my colleagues, including Professor Kamal and the rest, uh, sent me books just now after dinner. I thought, oh, how wonderful it would have been if I could have received it last year. <laughs> then I would be able to uh, really, I mean, it's amazing. You can spend 10 hours a day reading books. I happen, happen to be just your friend. I mean, you meditate, you read the Quran, you memorize verses of the Quran, much more now than ever before. <laughs> but I think um, devouring books was a real wonderful and great pleasure. Um, gives you so much uh, solid satisfaction and uh, contain your sanity, and avoid madness in prison. But Tocqueville talks about general societal uh, reform, oh, and, uh, looking at the, the, the early period in the United States uh, history, um, about the problem of education and society, which must be addressed. This is uh, different from an elitist discourse. The stark reality is there is grinding poverty in the Ummah and in this country. The stark reality is there's a gross inequality from those who are given the opportunity to get the best of education and facilities and those who have no means to get good education. So this whole rhetoric and slogan of UNESCO about democratization, democratization of, of access to quality education is still certainly very far from its target. Tocqueville said the danger of society, including education, when he can clearly allow or move to create two classes, one small, the other many, separating each other, separating from each other. Now, some of us look purely into statistical numbers, between the rich and the poor, but the stark reality is, when there is gross injustice, marginalization, neglect, then you will create within our societies one full of jealousy, defiance, and hate, and the other with their heads in the clouds. I'm cautioning you so that elites and intellectuals in this country, in our society and the Ummah, will not create those with heads in the clouds. This is more relevant here in this country because when we saw such gigantic proportion of financial malfeasance, endemic corruption involving billions of dollars from public purse. You find political leaders damned scared, 
and you find elites intellectuals all or mostly muted. This led to a complete destruction of institutions of governance, the judiciary, the enforcement agencies, corruption commission, and of course, political leadership. Let us learn from the lessons of history. And by this societal reform and economic reform, create a society that is not only knowledgeable and competent to address the problems of the present society, including artificial intelligence, digital revolution, but also to ensure that there is justice and fairness for all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, thank you, Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim, for the presentation. Uh, I'm not going to make any comments. I just want to uh, introduce you the, actually, in this introduction, Professor John Esposito, many of you uh, know him very well. Um, but just in case there's some of you here who uh, are not familiar with him, let me uh, read to you the, the greatest, uh, the, the greatest the latest um, update on his uh, CV uh, for participants of the seminar, they already have that. But for those who just attending the forum tonight, let me uh, introduce uh, him to you. Uh, John Asposito is a university professor, professor of religion and international affairs, and of Islamic studies at Georgetown University. He's also the founding director of the Al Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding in the West School of Foreign Studies. Previously, he was a Loyola Professor of Middle East Studies, College of the Holy Cross, a past president of the American Academy of Religion and Middle East Studies, Associations of North America. Esposito has served as consultant to the U.S. Department of State and other agencies, European and Asian governments, corporations, universities, and media worldwide, and ambassador for the UN Alliance of Civilizations and was a member of the World Economic Forum's Council of 100 Leaders. Uh, Professor Eposito has received honorary doctorate from many universities, including the University of Sarajevo um, and University of Florida. He received the American Academy of Religions Martin Mati Award for the Public Understanding of Religion, Pakistan's Quid Azam Award for Outstanding Contributions to Islamic Studies. He has written more than 50 books. He produced books at a faster rate than we can read them. So I don't know what is the latest, uh, what's the latest book uh, that we have here. Uh, yes, uh, and also he has, he has, well, his books and articles have been translated into more than 45 languages of the world. One achievement. So I think I have here the last book here, The Future of Islam, Islamophobia, and the Challenge of Pluralism in the 21st Century. Okay, please join. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I was sitting on the stage and getting a little depressed. I realized the first time I came here was 46 years ago, and I thought, I think I'm getting old. Uh, um, I want to um, apologize. Most of you, if you've ever seen me speak, I usually look at my notes. Um, but because of the nature of what I'm talking about, and um, because this is 10 minutes after I usually go to bed, which is at 9 o'clock at night, I prefer to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I think I'll try to watch my notes. Dealing with... <clears throat> The question tonight that I want to address is religion and multiculturalism in the public square. Uh, I can't emphasize too much the fact that I believe that the challenge in the 21st century is pluralism, religious pluralism and political pluralism. If you look around the world and you look at what's happening in the world and you don't see that the issue of multiculturalism and pluralism is important. 
then it means that you don't look at what's going on. Now, in Malaysia and Indonesia, you have far more diversity and you have countries that have had a multicultural context, multi-ethnic, multi-religious context. Uh, but that's not the case in many parts of the Muslim world and certainly not in many parts of the Middle East. But if you look at the realities in the West today, one sees a slide backwards. We are racing in the opposite direction of where we should go. In Europe and America, having developed and worked at developing reasonable democracies and pluralism, in fact, we're often going in the opposite direction. The rise of the far right of, of white nationalism uh, in Europe and its impact on immigration and certainly on Muslims, its feeding of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism cannot be denied. All you have to do is look at the headlines every day. If you want to see the reality of this, go to bridge.georgetown.edu. It's a, pro a project that we created at Georgetown. Bridge.georgetown.edu. You will see material every day published on this issue. If you look at America, you look at American elections, the presidential elections that President Obama was involved in, when a significant number of his opposition, in fact, went after him with the accusation that he was a Muslim. And if you look at the man that led the accusation that in fact, he wasn't really born in America, wasn't a citizen and may have been a Muslim and see that he's now president of the United States, you will realize we have a problem. When the president of a country says Islam hates us, I think it's probably a certain level of ignorance. I kept saying, well, he probably thinks there's a person named Islam because he can't think that you can say Islam hates us. And when challenged in mass media, repeats that. And, the, and says things like, and there are so many of them. When, and the, when one implements a Muslim ban, when one talks about Mexicans, Hispanics, etc., and basically is anti-immigrant, that same issue of being anti-immigrant we see also sweeping through Europe, that's a problem. Now, I remember years ago, the first time I came here, and I gave a lecture, I gave a series of lectures, and I, was, I didn't even have my doctorate. And um, the last lecture was on Islam in the West. So the first part of my half of my lecture was a frontal critique of Western colonialism and its impact, etc. The audience loved it, obviously. Uh, then I felt I had to talk about the other side of the coin. And then there was the ambivalence. You know, oh, I wonder, where, I wonder what the influences there are. Probably because he's from the West, he's an Orientalist, etc. All my teachers were Muslim. My main teacher was Ismail al Faruqi. But the reality of it is that we don't have a choice. It's not a matter of debating. And what's a little depressing is what occurred to me at the Islamic Society of North America's uh, meeting. Uh, I was on a panel with uh, a young, well, at my age, everybody that's under 80 is young. Um, and after it, a man stopped me and said, uh, a Muslim, I don't know from where, I really enjoyed your talk, but I was a little concerned. You know, you talked about pluralism. He said, and you know, my imam said that pluralism is polytheism and it's haram. I said, excuse me? I thought maybe I couldn't understand his accent. He said, pluralism is polytheism. So I'm very conscious of where I'm going with this talk and I, and, and I, I wanna bring that out. But the reality of it is if you look at the Muslim world, I would say there's Islamophobia in Egypt. Muslim against Muslim. And I would say in many parts of the Gulf, where you have mainstream Islamic activists, not extremists and terrorists, and they have to worry about how the government is going to respond and the security forces, I would say that's discrimination, and I would say it's Islamophobia. But where we are today is influenced by recent years. I mean, what are some of the, the causes that feed kind of anti-Islam, anti-Muslim attitude. 
Number one, the media. Now, it's not just a matter of bashing the media, it's dealing with the reality of the media. On the one hand, there's a phrase with media, if it bleeds, it leads. You put on the news, and if you want to grab an audience, I don't care where you go in the world, you lead off with these catastrophic situations. When I first taught, moved and taught in Boston, and then when I went to Washington, my mother would come, put the, new, you know, put the TV on, the first thing she'd say to me the next morning is, you can't stay here, look at all the crime. On the other hand, my mother was from New York City. Many people don't want to go to New York because they think it's all crime. Well, a lot of it has to do with media coverage. So let me give you an example. I'm going to be very specific here in terms of uh, what I'm talking about. There is a group called Media Tenor that looked at 975,000 pieces of Western media. 975,000 pieces of Western media. And it looked at it from 2001 to 2011. So it looked at all that media and said, where do we find Islam and Muslims? It found that 2% in 2001 of media stories and Western media presented image, is, images of Muslim militants and violence. 0.1% looked at what the vast majority of Muslims were like or what was going on in, if you will, mainstream world. Jump to 2011, the 2% jumps to 25% negative, and the other side remains at 0.1%. That's a disparity, an important one. But jump to 2015, 2016, and it finds that another study that looked at Western media, Eight out of 10 stories were about extremists and terrorists. Even stories about mainstream Muslims, some of them were actually very provocative and contentious. When they focused on individuals, when they did, they tended to be terrorists or warlords. So you've got that impact. Now, why, how does they, this really get, you know, real, as it were, traction in terms of moving forward? The fact is we've had major studies for example, looking at the US in terms of support for these kind of anti-Muslim uh, stories, anti-Muslim organizations. And studies have shown that close to $120 million has gone, a, phil a philanthropy of money has gone to these organizations, okay? What do you see in terms of the Muslim world and Muslim societies responding to it, or in the US and in Europe. Not all that much. It often, the community is very concerned about what's going on, but it doesn't look at what do we need to do to address that issue. With regard to the relationship of Islam to multiculturalism and to issues of pluralism, I can't believe that anybody, certainly anybody that's read the Quran, let alone study uh, Muslim history, does not have a sense of the way in which God in the Quran affirms the decision to create not just one single nation or tribe, but a world of different nations, ethnicities, tribes, and languages. O oh, humankind, we have created you male and female and made you, nation, made you nations and tribes so that you might come to know one another. Didn't say to fight one another. The Quran's recognition of the human community's religious diversity, and we debate today often in the West, is diversity a good thing rather than diversity can be a richness, not just a negative. But the Quran's recognition of the human community's religious diversity and support of religious pluralism can be found in the text to everyone we have appointed a way and a course to follow. For each there is a direction toward which he turns. Vie therefore, compete therefore, with one another in the performance of good works. Wherever you may be, God shall bring you all together on the day of judgment. Surely God has power over all these things. I'll interrupt my citations from the Quran to tell you about a humorous thing that happened to me 20 years ago. I keynoted a conference of Muslims in America. And after it, a fellow from Jordan came up to me, put his arm on my shoulder and said, Brother John, mashallah, I really enjoyed your talk. You've had, I mean, you're really doing such good work. He said, but you know, and then he looked, at, looked into my eyes and he said, 
you're not getting any younger. You know, like you'd better make the move now because God knows when you're going to die and it could be pretty soon. Anyway, that was probably 30 years ago. All right. Back to the Quran. Jews and Christians are seen as people of the book. It's a simple fact. There's more pluralism, from my point of view, uh, or support for pluralism, for diversity, for the fact that God's creation was created that way, than when confined in many other religious texts. And of course, the phrase, there is no compulsion in Islam. Sometimes when I read stories or when I see things happening in some Muslim countries, I think there's no compulsion in Islam. I'm not quite sure about that. The challenge of multiculturalism and religious pluralism is the challenge in the 21st century. It's not just a religious issue. It's also a political issue. It's a cultural issue. Because it impacts not only immigrants, but it impacts people who are just different and other. A robust religious pluralism is a prerequisite for life and for international relations. Look at where we are in the world today. Mm. I have to be careful, this is being recorded. I have to watch my language, it's too bad. Um, when I first got out as an academic, and I remember talking to a friend of mine who was also on the National Security Council for President, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for President uh, years ago. I was sure in my lifetime, I thought, gosh, I really feel sorry for all of those poor, and you can fill the word in after that, people who've worked for peace in Palestine and are now retiring and haven't, feel like they haven't accomplished anything. They're like researchers looking, spending your whole life trying to solve a disease and at the end of it saying, I have it made. I knew in my lifetime that wouldn't be an issue. I was sure that things would move forward in terms of development in the Muslim world, and it has. But in many countries, it can be a step backwards. It's not just, being underdeveloped is not just a question of poverty. It can be a question of the kind of resources and the style of life that's taking place. Just because you have wealth in a country doesn't mean that you're really all that developed. Just because you have brand new buildings that look great it doesn't mean that in terms of your values, in terms of equity in the society, in terms of concern about poverty, concern about repression, concerned about imprisonment, you know, that you necessarily are doing well. We are all challenged today to move beyond the older established notion of tolerance. Tolerance today is an insulting word. If I say, I tolerate you, that means I let you live. That's what it meant historically. You can, we can coexist didn't mean that we really coexist, talk to each other, you know, wouldn't mind ha be, having you as a neighbor, etc. Tolerance meant that you aren't gonna persecute the other. So we need to broaden that term. I, I think we need a new term, but we need to at least broaden that term so that we again realize that true tolerance means mutual respect, understanding, even when we don't agree and supporting the civil liberties and the rights of all people, regardless of who they are. Regrettably, at times, a significant number of some of our religious leaders in Christianity, in Judaism, in Islam, and we see what's going on with regard to the Rohingya in Burma, really take positions that actually simply privilege one against the other and actually legitimate the marginalization and even persecution of the other. Don't even allow for that minimum of tolerance. The engagement in the public square of communities, religious, social, in neighborhoods, in towns, in education, in schools, and common social issues is central to our moving forward. Interfaith dialogue is important, but it's a dialogue of life. It's not just that we get together and discuss some theology. It's what are you going to do with that? In what way are you going to implement it in society? It's educational reform, not just in the universities,
but in the madrasas, the seminaries, the schools that train our religious leaders, because our religious leaders very often influence the nature of the next generation through their khutbahs, through their advice, through the positions that they take. It's outreach and training programs for high school teachers and college teachers and university teachers. We at Georgetown in the center that I founded, we do a lot of that outreach, that training of teachers because the teachers again impact that generation. It's interfaith youth groups. One of the best ways to, to, to move forward is interfaith youth groups. If you get to actually be with somebody and you're around them, you get to know them. I remember being in Singapore and I asked a young diplomat how much uh, influence, um, how much he interacted with Malays within Singapore. And he told me that the first time that happened was when as a junior diplomat, they had to go away for a week together, you know, all of the diplomats. And that was the first time he engaged someone who was Malay and who was Muslim. I remember being in a country that has a significant number of Muslim populations and having one of the senior leaders in the country, first question he wanted to ask me is, why would somebody want to become a Muslim? Now, as my father used to say to his three sons when we disagreed with him, you're too bright to be that stupid. And I wanted to say that to him, but we need to be concerned about what's going on in that, in that world that we live in. We need to, to heed projects like Common Word. So let me ask you a question. I mean this seriously. Those of you who know what a common word between us and you is, okay, what that document is, would you raise your hands? Well, pretty depressing. I just saw about 10 hands go up. It's about five better than many audiences that I have. Here you have a major document done by 130 Muslim leaders around the world and then extended to another 300 or 400. Go on the internet and look up Common Word. A major document signed off by religious leaders who then reached out to major Christian leaders around the world, the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, etc., that talks about the fact that we can have our differences, but we also have a global situation, which means that we have to work together connected, we have religious roots for that cooperation, and that is love of God and love of neighbor. But how often, when we ask the question or answer it, who is the neighbor, do we really include some of the others? And even within religious communities at times, the more conservative versus the more progressive often talk about each other as if they weren't even in the same faith. I avoided a word that I actually like tonight, which is liberal, even better than progressive. The reason I avoided it is that I had a friend of mine tell me that somebody said to them, they asked a friend of theirs, are you going to come tonight? And he said, what, to listen to two liberals? I know he meant Osman and Anwar, and certainly not me. But, um, so I'll just say progressives or, ref or reform-minded. So where are we in terms of moving forward? This is a very important sentence that I use. In public events in my family, if I have to speak, my wife speaks for me. Uh, I, I embody the... Uh, emotional Italian, but it's the good news. Next time I come, any wedding or funeral you have, even if I don't know the person, you bring me there, as at my wedding, I cried, my wife didn't. Okay, people of all faiths and no faith, people of all faiths and no faith are challenged to embrace a pluralism based on mutual understanding and respect. Mutual understanding and respect doesn't mean that we agree about everything. It does mean that we take the time to learn about the other, that we understand and we respect their right to believe and do what they want as long as it doesn't affect or harm us because we expect that in return. If we don't have that, and in many of our societies, we don't. In many societies in the Muslim world and in many societies I've articulated it, in many parts of Europe and America. I was at a conference on uh, 
uh, Islamophobia in Europe two years ago, and a woman from Poland got up and said, the good news is we don't have many Muslims. The bad news is we have Islamophobia. You know, that it's very strong. And then I went to another conference, and a lawyer, Australian, said exactly the same thing. You know, let alone when you have leaders of government making the statements that they do. Look at the elections in, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia, etc. Let alone the situation in France. We need to seek to know and understand before we judge. We need to ensure that judgments which have implications both domestically and internationally are fair and informed. You see, if you're able to say that there is an Islamic exceptionalism, see? Now, of course, some people might say there is because I'm Muslim and yeah, we're exceptional. No, Islamic exceptionalism means that when we talk about civility, when we talk about um, uh, development, when we talk in a lot of ways, it's as if Islam's a much different religion. One of the statements that I make is that I have the best of both worlds. I'm an academic and I'm asked the same questions throughout 40 or 50 years of my work. The same exact questions by diplomats, by business people, by ordinary citizens. What's Islam like as a faith? Does it really, you know, support the kind of violence that's out there? Is Islam this? Is Islam that? That's why I did the book, with, you know, What Everyone Needs to Know About Islam, and did a new book called What Everyone Needs to Know About Sharia. We need to display a self-criticism that recognizes, this is a very important point, that all religions, including our own, have a transcendent side, that we can agree on, a belief in a transcendent reality, we would say God, and the transcendent side is that if you follow God's way, you transcend your more base notions and attitudes and become a better person. But they all have a history that has a dark side. All religions have people who have appropriated and engaged in what I would call unholy wars, you see, and unholy crusades and unholy etc. All of them have a dark side where either emperors used it or religious leaders used religion to legitimate what they were going to do. And we see that certainly in recent years when we look at extremist groups across religions. I teach a course called Religion and Violence, Terror in the Name of God. We need to identify and promote the many shared beliefs, values, interests, without denying the differences and the uniqueness of our own religious traditions. In an age of globalization and increased religious and ethnic diversity, but also violence that often occurs and persecution, we need a religious pluralism and sense of multiculturalism founded on a deep understanding and respect one that will truly meet the needs of the 21st century. Thank you.